All right, now that the witness is sworn, before we get started with testimony, let me just inquire briefly. Dr. Christensen, have you reviewed any of the trial testimony in this case, either by reading it or listening to it in any means, either uh, through the Internet or observing it at any of the viewing locations? No, I have not. Okay, thank you for your response. When you're testifying, please talk directly into that microphone and please use verbal responses to answer any questions so we make a clear record and also try to avoid speaking at the same time as anyone questioning you. With that in mind then, Ms. Blake, you can inquire on your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you please state your name and spell your name for the record? Sure. Eric Christensen. It's E-R-I-K, -E last name C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-S-E-N. What is your current occupation? I'm currently employed as a forensic pathologist by the Utah Department of Health and Human Services, where I serve as the chief medical examiner for the state of Utah. And is your title doctor? Yes. What experience, well, actually, let me back up. What education do you have in order to hold the position you have? Uh, sure. I have an undergraduate degree. Uh, in uh, philosophy uh, that I, I attended then medical school at the University of Virginia. Uh, following my uh, medical school training, I did an internship in pediatrics at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, and then uh, subsequent to that did uh, pathology residency training in anatomic and clinical pathology. Um, following completion of that training, I spent some time as a hospital-based pathologist uh, for a couple of years prior to doing uh, a specific fellowship training in forensic pathology. And uh, since that time, I've been employed as a forensic pathologist. And can you explain a little bit about what a pathologist in general is? <laughs> Sure. Uh, pathology is a specialty of medicine, just like internal medicine or pediatrics or surgery, um, that is aimed at the, uh, making diagnoses of conditions uh, based on the evaluation and analysis of either fluid samples uh, or tissue samples or cell samples, and also by means of uh, an autopsy. Um, all of those things fall under the purview of uh, Pathologists, for example, if you go have blood drawn, um, all of that blood runs is run in a hospital lab that is uh, directed and supervised by a pathologist. Um, if you have a biopsy of something taken to find out if it's cancerous or infectious or whatever, all of those things are evaluated by pathologists uh, to make a determination as to what the uh, what the diagnosis is. And then autopsies are also done by a pathologist to determine cause of death. And if you, in conducting autopsies, is that a special branch of pathology? Is that the forensic pathology? So uh, the performance of autopsies is part and parcel of anatomic pathology. Um, to be a forensic pathologist, you are required to first have board certification and training in anatomic pathology and then subsequently receive uh, special training in forensic pathology, which is uh, aimed at the evaluation of sudden, unexpected, and non-natural deaths, um, things that typically fall to the jurisdiction of either a medical examiner or a coroner. Have you worked as a forensic pathologist uh, in other locations than Salt Lake? Yes, I have. And where else have you worked as a forensic pathologist? Um, I've worked uh, as a forensic pathologist in uh, Virginia as well as South Carolina prior to moving to Utah. And with regard to your work in Utah, can you tell us a little bit Actually, let me back up. In Utah, with regard to a death certificate, who is it that would determine the cause and manner of death? So in Utah, the system uh, is such that uh, for most deaths in I'm the state... I'm going to object. I don't think this is relevant to this case. It's, he's, he's dealing with Utah. Ms. Blake, response? Your Honor, I think it goes to his training and experience and what his job duties are within the state of Utah. While well, he conducted an autopsy for the state of Idaho, I think it is relevant. Uh, for foundational purposes, then I'll overrule that objection. Thank you, Honor. 
Okay. Who, who in Utah is the person that determines the cause of death or manner of death on a death certificate? Sure. For, for cases that do not fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner in Utah, that would be just whoever the person's primary care doctor or attending physician was if they're a hospitalized patient. For deaths that occur uh, and fall to the jurisdiction of the medical examiner, which is about 20% of the deaths in the state of Utah, um, all of those uh, death certificates are signed by our staff um, of 10 forensic pathologists. In Utah, do they employ the coroner system? No. No. Coroners, um, at, there's a lot of regional variability as to how that happens throughout the country. Uh, some states uh, like Idaho, South Carolina, other places that I'm familiar with uh, have uh, at each, each county has a coroner uh, who's assigned to uh, elected to investigate deaths that are sudden, unexpected, and non-natural. Um, some states have uh, moved to institute a medical examiner system instead of a uh, coroner system. In some states, that's done on a statewide basis as it is in Utah. Some places it's done on a county-by-county county basis where there may be um, some of the larger counties in a state, for example, may have a medical examiner, but the smaller jurisdictions may still have elected coroners. Have you previously worked in systems that have the coroner, uh, or in states, excuse me, that have the coroner system in place? Yes. And in those jurisdictions, a coroner is separate from a forensic pathologist, correct? That's correct. And as a forensic pathologist, you've talked about the background and training and education you have to have. In your experience, do coroners require that same training and experience? No, they're not required to have that. Most places, the statutory uh, requirements to be the coroner is obviously you have to be elected, but then you also have to have uh, have to be a registered voter usually in the county where you're elected, can't have any felony convictions. Uh, but there's, uh, beyond that, no general uh, specific requirements, although that varies a little bit from state to state. And do you know approximately how many autopsies you have conducted at this point in your career? Uh, around 7,200. Do you, did you end up conducting an autopsy on an individual named Tamara or Tammy Daybell? Yes. Do you recall approximately when you became involved um, in the process of starting the autopsy? Yes. Um, so our... Well, the autopsy itself was done on December 11th uh, following uh, a disinterment order from the district court. But our first, our office's initial involvement in that process was probably in November of 2019. Uh, we were approached uh, by someone from Fremont County uh, with questions about that process. Uh, and so we provided some guidance on how that would be required to, to proceed. And... Did you, in fact, um, attend the exhumation of Tammy Daybell's body? I did. And were you present when her body was transported, or excuse me, was loaded for transportation to your office? Yes. Did you see her uh, her casket loaded into the transportation vehicle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Were you also present at your office when the body arrived? Yes. When a body is exhumed, is it common for you or someone from your office to attend that exhumation? Yes, that's fairly routine. Um, there are a lot of different reasons that exhumations might be done. Um, sometimes it's uh, to allow for the collection of DNA samples in a case, an uh, older case, for example, where DNA technology was not what it is now. Um, sometimes it's just for uh, logistical reasons. A family wants to move a person from one place to another. Uh, and they may or may not have had an autopsy or a death certificate previously, and so we get involved in those cases to certify the death. Um, and then sometimes it's for uh, evaluation of potential criminal circumstances. And does your office do more than just conduct the autopsy itself? Um, in the process of investigating a death that comes to our jurisdiction, uh, we spend uh, 
a lot of time both uh, up front to the extent that we can and very frequently for an extended period after the examination is complete, gathering information. And that is uh, sort of usually in the form of uh, medical records, police records, uh, interview statements, uh, other, other information that is available that helps us understand uh, the circumstances surrounding the person's death. It's somewhat like when you go see your doctor, for example. Um, you don't just walk in. He doesn't just do an exam and say, here's what we're doing. He talks to you. He gathers information from you about what your symptoms have been, how long they've been going on, have they gotten worse, are they getting better, all of those kinds of things. And obviously we can't speak to our patients, but that information gathering for us in that realm happens through records review and talking to people who knew what was going on with that person. And with regard to Tammy Daybell, did you in fact obtain some records to review? Yes. And did you speak with individuals involved in, already involved in an investigation? Yes, we did. Did you do that? Did you do some of that prior to actually performing the autopsy? Yes. Uh, in the setting of an exhumation or disinterment case, it's a little bit unique in the sense that uh, it, it it can be planned out a little bit more, and so we can gather information before that disinterment and the subsequent examination happens. Uh, in this case, we did have the ability to gather some information from uh, Fremont County, uh, from both the sheriff's office and the coroner's office, as to their investigation of Tammy's death up to that, uh, to the point that she was uh, released for burial and transported to Utah. And so we did have some of that information. Then, obviously, uh, subsequent to the exam, uh, we gathered a, a lot, lot of additional information, which we also reviewed. And is that common practice uh, for how your office handles uh, the full process of the autopsy or investigation? Yes, that's pretty typical. Are exhumations very common in your experience? No. Um, I've been involved with, over the course of my career, a dozen or two at the most. I mean, it's not an, out of 7,200 autopsies, it's not a common occurrence. And when you performed the autopsy of Tammy Daybell, was anyone else present with you? Um, so our, uh, at that time, she was a trainee in our office, Dr. Lily Marsden, uh, who's a board-certified uh, pathologist who was at that point specifically uh, in our office to train as a forensic pathologist. Uh, she was involved in the examination with me and then uh, in the uh, uh course of an autopsy, we have uh, members of our autopsy staff that are there for taking photographs, uh, helping us collect samples and evidence uh, and other uh, other items that we, you know, deem that we need to collect. And then uh, um, that's, and sometimes there are also law enforcement personnel present. Uh, in this case, I believe uh, uh, the coroner from Fremont County was present for the examination, as was uh, Lieutenant Powell. Um, I can't recall who else off the top of my head. And did you and Dr. Marsden conduct this autopsy in conjunction with each other? Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you discuss the, the findings as you were conducting the autopsy? Yes, both as we conducted it and uh, discussed them frequently as we were uh, finalizing the report and opinion. If a body is exhumed, does that make it so that an autopsy is more difficult to be performed, or does it change how you would perform an autopsy? So the, the primary differences in, in the setting of uh, a, a disinterred or exhumed body, um, most of the time those people have been embalmed already, which uh, changes the nature of their tissues. It has all been what we refer to as fixed because of the embalming fluid, makes it somewhat more stiff, uh, and a little less pliable, but it also preserves it. And so uh, it's a little more difficult to do the exam just because of the stiffness of the body and the tissues, uh, but it's something that we do on a fairly regular basis, even on uh, cases where there was not a disinterment, because uh, uh, funeral homes as a, as a practice tend to embalm bodies fairly quickly once they receive custody of the person. And sometimes bodies will go get embalmed before they realize somebody realizes that they need to come to us for an examination. So we have quite a lot of experience dealing with uh, embalmed bodies, less with disinterred bodies, but the process is basically the same. The only other difference with a disinterred body uh, really has more to do with the nature of the 
uh, you know, the burial and the preservation if, uh, in this case, uh, the vault in which her casket was preserved was dry uh, and well-maintained, and so there wasn't a lot of uh, water or other damage, which we sometimes encounter. Uh, there was also... Uh, um, uh, her embalming was pretty good, and uh, it had also not been a long, long uh, period of time since she had been interred, and all of those things, uh, you know, can make a difference. The only real uh, finding related to her burial uh, that was still present besides the embalming was the growth of some mold in various places on her body. Can you walk us through how an autopsy is conducted? Sure. Um, so an autopsy uh, examination in a forensic context is a medical procedure that is aimed at evaluating the uh, presence or absence of injuries, uh, presence or absence of natural disease. Uh, we collect samples for toxicology uh, so we know what uh, intoxicants may or may not have played a role in the death. Um, all of those things are done. Generally, we begin with an external examination, which involves a, a detailed examination of the body uh, as it as it arrives. Excuse me. We then uh, uh, take photographs all along the way of the body with clothing. Uh, then clothing is removed. Uh, if there are visible injuries, those are photographed both before they are cleaned and then after they're cleaned. Um, and uh, any uh, trace evidence that might be present, we uh, collect at that point as well. Uh, once we are done with the external uh, surfaces of the body, both front and back, uh, we then proceed with an internal examination looking at all of the organs uh, from the brain uh, to the rectum and everything in between to evaluate them uh, for you know their uh, any pathologic or disease process that might be present. Uh, and at that time, we also collect samples that can be used for toxicology testing. Uh, there are some settings where we do additional uh, dissections, uh, looking at different parts of the soft tissue. Uh, for example, sometimes we'll do a, a layered neck dissection where we evaluate the various layers of musculature in the neck, looking for evidence of injury. Um, and there's other specialized exams that we will do in some cases, uh, not every case. Um, we also generally will take x-rays of the body uh, to evaluate for the presence of implanted hardware, skeletal trauma, um, both older and new, uh, and any other uh, uh, information that might be yielded from the uh, from an X-ray examination. Sometimes that also discloses natural disease that we can see. So all of those things are done, and then uh, we collect samples also uh, during the course of the autopsy to look at under the microscope, uh, so that we can assess even if an organ looks normal. For example, sometimes under the microscope it may not be normal, and so we uh, look at tissue samples that way. We also uh, take time to look at injuries uh, under the microscope in some cases because they can also provide us information about how old an injury is. You know, how long has it been there? Uh, certainly nothing to the degree of precision that you see on TV where somebody says this person died at, you know, 537 last night. But uh, we can, uh, through that sort of analysis, allow uh, for a sort of a broad swath of time. Is this Did this injury happen around the time of death? Is it more than a few hours old? Is it days old? Is it weeks old? And in conducting the autopsy on Tammy Daybell, did you, in fact, reach a conclusion as to the cause and manner of death? Yes, we did. And what were those? We determined her cause of death uh, to be the result of asphyxia um, and her manner of death to be homicide. And when you use the term homicide, can you talk about what that means uh, mm -hmm. in terms of your office? Sure. So... Uh, we did not certify Tammy's death in terms of signing the death certificate because she didn't die in Utah, but we make the same determination. A, the determination of manner of death, we have basically five options that are on the death certificate. A death can be determined to be natural. It can be suicide. It can be accident. Or, or it can be a homicide. And then there's a fifth option where you can determine, it, you can just say we can't determine. We, we can't decide between which of these options it is depending on the nature of the case. Um, those, that, that determination is a, an administrative function uh, that is uh, performed for vital records purposes, um, is recorded on the death certificate, and is used to broadly categorize the types of deaths that happen in a given location uh, so that, uh, you know, 
efforts can be made to try and prevent different types of death and be aware of the different uh, categories and classes of deaths that happen in a non-natural way. And when you talk about the term asphyxia, uh, can you tell the jury what you mean by that term? Sure. Asphyxiation is simply a process by which a person uh, is deprived of, of oxygen. They're not allowed to, to uh, breathe or intake sufficient oxygen to allow their uh, life to continue. And that can be by any number of different means. Asphyxia is a very broad category uh, that includes uh, deaths from, you know, technically drowning is an asphyxial death. Any kind of suffocation or smothering uh, is an asphyxial death. Hanging deaths tend to be uh, asphyxial deaths. Um, and there are also chemical asphyxiants. Carbon monoxide, for example, impairs person's ability to use oxygen. But broadly speaking, we use that term uh, to apply to cases where someone is unable to get uh, sufficient oxygen into their system to allow them to continue living. And you talked a little bit about how the process of an autopsy with regard to Tammy Daybell, did you see any external injuries or any obvious injuries that would have been the cause of her death? No. Can you walk us through how you ended up reaching your conclusion regarding homicide and asphyxiation? Sure. Um, asphyxiation as a cause of death is really a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, it, it, it requires that you have evaluated other possible causes of death and excluded them as contributing to the death. Essentially, in, in this case, um, and many cases like it, a, you have what we would term a mostly negative autopsy, meaning there's no uh, pathology, no natural disease, and no evident injuries that are visible at autopsy that would explain why this person died. Um, and most asphyxial deaths fall into that category as well. There are a limited number of things that can cause deaths uh, without leaving any changes that are visible in the body as to why the person died. Um, and some of those are natural, some of them are non-natural. Um, in this case, um, the, two, the two primary natural causes that you know can result in this sort of uh, change are uh, seizures. Uh, someone can certainly have a seizure and die from seizures. Um, Generally speaking, we see that in the setting of uh, people with known seizure disorder. Um, uh, and in this case, we didn't have any history. Uh, there was certainly some history related to us that she may have had some seizure-like activity uh, in the days uh, you know, prior to her death, but no uh, medical evaluation that we could find for any of those symptoms, no uh, indication that she had a diagnosis of epilepsy. It would also be quite unusual for a woman at her age to suddenly develop seizures um, out of the blue, that having her very first ever epileptic seizure occur at that age. It certainly does happen sometimes, but uh, it's certainly more common uh, in an older person to be uh, a man, and it's also more common for uh, that uh, that to occur in the setting of uh, some other uh, brain pathology, for example, like a stroke uh, that had, was new, something changed in the brain, or uh, the slow growth over time of a brain tumor. Uh, that's, for example, how John McCain, um, Ted Kennedy, and others that had uh, brain tumors, some of their initial symptoms were seizures. Um, and so that, uh, you know, again, she did not have any of that. Her brain was uh, totally normal. Um, and so uh, for that to be her cause of death just is, is very, very unlikely. So we uh, have excluded that on that basis. Um, other things that can cause, you know, natural causes of a sudden death uh, with no findings at autopsy would be uh, arrhythmia disorders, rhythm disturbances. Your heart, in addition to being a pump, is also an electrical organ, and it is driven by the electrical circuits within it. And if those circuits get short-circuited, so to say, um, that can lead to a sudden death in an individual as well. Um, there are a number of inherited uh, disorders disorders uh, associated with uh, genes that make the channels that cause ions to flow in the heart that make that electrical circuitry work the way it's supposed to. People that have those inherited disorders can die suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, generally speaking, the people that have inherited forms of that uh, will also have some family history of that, although not always. Uh, but most of the time there will be some 
history of that. And it would also be unusual for it to occur again at, at her age, mostly that uh, that type of change presents in childhood or young adulthood. Um, so neither of those things is, is very likely uh, given that. As far as non-natural causes of death, um, asphyxia, obviously I've told you that's what we concluded led to her death. Um, there uh, you know, are any number of ways that someone can be asphyxiated. That can be uh, from you know, suffocation, which is just a broad uh, description of anything that occludes the external airway. It uh, can also be the result of neck compression or chest compression. Um, uh, any of those things that impair someone's ability to breathe normally, even if they, uh, you know, are, if their mouth is not occluded, uh, certainly can uh, also lead to their death. Um, things that occlude the mouth tend to uh, act more quickly uh, in the sense if you adequately, you know, block someone's ability to breathe at all by occluding their nose and mouth, uh, they would lose consciousness, uh, you know, very quickly, a matter of, you know, 15 or 20 seconds um, if that, uh, occlusion is effectively held in place, um, and then that may or may not lead to their immediate death. Uh, they may continue to have, uh, 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 after loss of consciousness, may continue to have heartbeat for uh, for some period of time, but end up with what is called central apnea, meaning the changes to the brain have impaired their ability to breathe normally. So even if the occlusion is released, they may not breathe normally after that. Um, so asphyxia is certainly a a uh, one possibility in this case. Other other non-natural things that could potentially account for her death uh, would be uh, any kind of chemical intoxication uh, or drug overdose. Uh, we looked at, in this case, uh, an extensive array of uh, drugs, medications, uh, pesticides, uh, chemical weapons agents, lo lots of things, you know, way beyond what we normally look at and found no indication of anything in her system except for a, uh, what would be considered therapeutic level of uh, medication fluoxetine, which she had been taking for many years. Um, and no indication that that, uh, uh, played a role in her death. That, that substance has been, uh, associated with, um, uh, uh, some cardiac rhythm or abnormalities as well, uh, but uh, no indication that that play a role in, in her death. Um, and so those are the sort of the basic things. As she, in addition to having you know, no anatomical uh, abnormalities, no organ pathology uh, per se, no pneumonia, no other pathologic process that would explain her death, she did also have some injuries uh, on her arms, very nonspecific blunt injuries, uh, bruises uh, on her right arm, left arm, and on her left chest, uh, which were determined to be uh, relatively acute injuries, had happened you know, within the hours uh, around the time of her death. Um, would be, by their nature, blunt, those types of blunt injuries are not specific, uh, but they are certainly consistent with uh, someone being restrained um, and uh, would be, uh, you know, consistent with asphyxia as a, as a cause of death as well. And if we break some of that down a little bit, um, because you've indicated that the autopsy in this case is a negative autopsy because there is not a clear way to determine the cause of death. Is that correct? Yes. And you talked about one of the other potentials being seizures. Correct. Can seizure activity, and could you explain a little bit about what a seizure is? A seizure is uh, electro abnormal electrical activity in the brain uh, that causes, uh, can manifest in a variety of ways. Um, what we might typically think of as a generalized or convulsive seizures. Someone would collapse and have shaking movements um, for a period of time after a period of stiffness. Uh, people can also have what are called partial seizures uh, that result in staring spells or other types of inattention or uh, movements, abnormal movements of parts of the body. Um, any, any of those types of seizure disorder uh, are potentially uh, put the person at risk for sudden death. Have you conducted autopsies before where there is evidence of seizure activity? Yes. Um, so some, you, know, you certainly don't have to have anything 
there's no, you may not have any evidence at autopsy, like I said, in the setting of a seizure, but sometimes uh, we do see things, for example, like tongue injuries if the person bites their tongue. Uh, we, and that can be both, you know, acute, acute injuries or healing injuries. Uh, we sometimes also see evidence of incontinence of either bowel or bladder uh, occurring at or around the time of death. Um, but those are, uh, I guess I would say soft signs, not really, uh, uh, they, they're not definitive for seizures, but they are sometimes associated with seizures. And you uh, did talk about that it would be uncommon for someone Tammy's age to have all of a sudden developed seizures or started having seizures. Yes. And do you know how old she was? 49. You also talked about there was really no evidence of her having seizure-like activity outside of some information provided. Was that information that you reviewed provided by Chad Daybell? Um, I believe that's what the, where the coroner said that information came from, yes. So it came to you through the coroner, uh, but was reported as having come from Chad Daybell? Yes. Did you review some medical records for Tammy Daybell as part of your investigation? Yes, we did. Did you see anything in the medical records that would support Tammy having seizure-like activity? No. Is that part of why... Um, is that part of your conclusion that it would be unlikely she died from a seizure? Uh, it contributes to that, yes. And then you talked about arrhythmia. Um, I think you said arrhythmia irregularities. I may have that wrong, but essentially something with the heart. Mm -hmm. And I believe you talked about, would it be similar because of Tammy's age, you wouldn't expect to see that a sudden onset of problems with the heart? Uh, certainly, I mean, middle age um, and older is a common time for people to develop heart disease. Um, and that can also include arrhythmias or rhythm disturbances, such as heart block and other things like that. But generally, uh, those do not present with sudden death. Um, they'll present with palpitations or other things like that. Um, in the setting of uh, uh, what we call the channelopathies, the you know inherited or uh, potentially acquired uh, conditions that lead to uh, lethal rhythm disturbances where a person has ventricular fibrillation, which is uh, incompatible with life. Um, those those conditions uh, do tend to be inherited and do tend to present at a much younger age than what she has, what she was. And then just to go over it as well, it sounded like one of the other um, causes that could result in a negative autopsy would be some kind of an intoxicant. Yes. Uh, can you sometimes see signs of someone dying of an intoxicant? Uh, certainly there are a number of things that we see. Um, and, you know, drugs that lead to death or substances that lead to death by intoxication tend to lead to death by one of two means. I mean, all of us, when we die, ultimately our heart stops and our breathing stops. And so um, it's generally the medication or the substance has an action on one of those things. Opiates, for example, and other central nervous system depressant agents tend to suppress breathing. They either slow your breathing down or stop it, um, which then leads to once your breathing is inadequate, will ultimately lead to your heart stopping. Other medications are directly toxic to the heart. Um, but things, any of those types of suppressant medications that lead, or depressant medications rather, that lead to uh, respiratory failure um, also lead to what is called pulmonary edema, uh, which is the presence of fluid buildup within the lungs, uh, which sometimes then also is uh, visible externally as it comes up the airways and out in the setting of a fatal intoxication. When you talk about intoxicants, um, does that also include what would commonly be known or referred to as poisons? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you talked about doing some testing for intoxicants, and so that would encompass poison as well? Uh, yes, I mean there is no such thing, uh, for example, as a the ability to test for you know every possible substance. Um, uh, toxicology labs just sort of generally are not structured that way. It's the the lab that we use does a very broad uh, screening for hundreds of. Uh, of the more common, and even many of those are not very common, but hundreds of the more common illicit drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and prescription medications um, 
to, you know, see are they present or are they not. Um, in addition, in this case, we also looked at, you know, uh, heavy metals, um, you know, lead, arsenic, selenium, and other things that uh, are, are known to be intoxicants. We looked at um, organophosphate pesticides uh, to see if there was anything there that could potentially lead to her death. Um, looked at cyanide. Um, looked at, had our uh, chemical threat laboratory uh, at the Utah Public Health Laboratory do some testing for uh, both uh, additional or organophosphate uh, poisons, nerve agents, um, that are generally seen only in the context of uh, uh, chemical weapons attacks. Um, none of those were found. We also had them test for a couple of different uh, uh, biologic toxins, ricin and abrin, um, both of which were also not detected. Um, so we did a lot more testing in this case than we generally do in most cases, but all of it was negative except for the uh, medication that she was prescribed. And did you, in fact, was more than one agency involved with uh, the testing, the toxicology testing? Yes. So in addition to the chemical threat lab, m the rest of the testing was done at National Medical Services Lab, which is a reference laboratory that we use in Pennsylvania. And I believe you indicated this is one of the most extensive toxicology testings that you've been involved in with regards to an autopsy? Yes. And was the reason for that because it was a negative autopsy? Yes. And because of the uh, suspicious circumstances surrounding the death. When you do testing for substances, intoxicants, and the other things that we've talked about, what part of the body or what do you generally try to test with? In, in most cases, the optimal you know, substance for testing is blood. Um, that gives us an indication of what is going on in that person at the time of their death, what's circulating through their system. In her case, because she had been embalmed, blood is not available uh, for us to use for testing. And so in cases like that, whether it's because of prior embalming or because of decomposition, there's any number of reasons we do this, but uh, we will send liver samples to be tested, uh, mostly because those uh, there are there are pretty good reference ranges uh, for postmortem testing in, in liver tissue. And in your opinion, did the fact that Tammy was embalmed inhibit the ability to test for those substances? It didn't inhibit it. It slowed it down some. We had to certainly do some redirection um, on a few things, uh, but uh, it didn't. It did not change things ultimately. No. Was there anything from the toxicology testing that stood out to you? Um, no, I mean, no, other than her, you know, the presence of her, ther her medication at a therapeutic or what would be considered a normal level, um, everything. There was not an intoxication, uh, a toxicologic explanation for her death. And, Your Honor, I'm going to ask if I can uh, get Exhibits 295A to L that were previously admitted. Mr. Bailiff, sorry. Could I just briefly look at those? It'll be quicker for me to... Uh, I'd like to see them, too. All right, Council, I'm going to go ahead and suggest we take the uh, mid-afternoon break, and then we'll get into the exhibits and pictures. If that works for you, I apologize to interrupt, but we're right about the correct No, I think, I think that'll work right now. Okay, thank you, thank you Ms. Blake. All right, please.
All right, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Uh, before you start with examination, can I have a quick sidebar with counsel? <coughs> All right, we're back on the record on CR 22211624. Ms. Blake, you're continuing your direct examination of Dr. Christensen. You can continue at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so we've been talking about uh, the autopsy and what all that entails. After doing the external, when you started to look at the internal part of Ms. Daybell, including her organs, did her organs appear normal? Um, for the most part, they appeared essentially normal, uh, except for changes related to embalming. Um, and there was also fluid present in the lungs and uh, sort of a frothy, uh, dried foam present in her airways. As part of your investigation, were you shown or did you review photos that were taken from the scene of where Tammy Dabo was discovered? Yes. And Your Honor, I'm going to ask to publish State's Exhibit 295J. It can be published. It's been previously admitted also. When you talk about the substance in the lung, uh, lungs, the frothy substance, um, is would it be similar to what we see here? Yes, this this picture is a little bit, I don't know, blurry is the right word, but um, this picture shows uh, what we call pulmonary edema foam or froth, uh, what's sometimes referred to as a foam cone uh, that exudes, uh, comes up from the lungs through the airways and out either the nose or the mouth or sometimes both. Um, it's a combination of uh, fluid, which has leaked from the capillaries into the air spaces and then mixes with the protein and other things that are in those air spaces that normally help keep them open and creates this bubbly, frothy fluid that then is uh, sometimes visible on the surface as it was here. And is that what pulmonary edema is? And this is a manifestation of pulmonary edema. You can certainly have quite florid pulmonary edema without it ever coming out, uh, and that is largely a post-mortem phenomenon. It doesn't generally happen when people are alive, but if their edema is sufficiently uh, severe as that uh, as it accumulates or uh, the fluid builds up, the air builds up in those spaces, it will sometimes push up and out of the out of the nose and mouth. Had you, in fact, conducted other autopsies where this frothy uh, foam had been present? Yes. And is pulmonary edema actually a cause of death? It is not. Um, would it be just a result of the cause of death? Yeah, generally speaking. So a, 
the pulmonary edema is a finding or a, you know, it's a physical manifestation of some underlying pathologic process. So um, we most commonly see this sort of change in the setting of opiate intoxications, um, heroin overdoses, oxycodone overdoses, and those sorts of things. Uh, but it's very common also in the setting of drowning. Uh, can be seen in asphyxial deaths of all kinds. Um, can also be seen in the setting of heart failure. There's any number of things that can cause pulmonary edema, but those, the pulmonary edema is not what leads to the person's death. It's the, the same thing that caused their death is also what causes the pulmonary edema. The pulmonary edema is just a manifestation of the cause of death, and there can be different things that cause it. Just like with a like hemorrhage is a nonspecific thing. You can bleed to death from lots of different things. You can bleed to death because you're shot. You could bleed to death because you're stabbed. You could bleed to death because you're in a car crash and suffered some fractures and other things. Lots of different things can lead to hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is sort of a mechanism or a finding in the setting of those other things, but it's those other things that are the cause of death. And in the context of pulmonary edema, it's whatever caused the pulmonary edema would be the cause of death. And is pulmonary edema a manifestation or a mechanism or a finding associated with asphyxiation being the cause of death? Yes, it is. Did this in part play into your finding that asphyxiation was the cause of death here? It did. And that was done in conjunction with ruling out the other causes of death that could result in or have a manifestation of pulmonary edema? Yes. We had also talked about you conducting uh, a review of the external body of Tammy Daybell, and you had indicated you noted some bruising. Yes, that's correct. And I believe you also indicated that bruising could be indicative of someone being restrained. It could be. And, Judge, I have States Exhibit 179A and 179B. These are blank diagrams, which I would intend to have handed to the victim to have him make some markings. Um, so I do not have copies for counsel or the court at this time, assuming they would want copies once the markings are made. I'm assuming she meant witness, not victim. Yes. yes. I did mean witness. <clears throat> Thank you for that correction, Mr. Thomas. 179 A and B then have been previously shown in a sidebar to counsel in the court. They can be presented to the witness. If any markings are made on those, we'll get copies made for the court's exhibit copy file as well as the defense, assuming they become admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And I had intended to wait uh, to move for the admission until after the markings were made and counsel had had an opportunity to review them as well. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. I can, I can proceed to mark them. Yes, Dr. Christensen, and what I was going to ask you to do is if you could mark on those exhibits where you located the bruising or the external injuries that you were referencing. Okay. And for the record, Dr. Christensen, what are you using to make the markings? Uh, it's like a Pentel Energel pen. <laughs> the color of the ink. Blue, it looks okay. like. I haven't written with it yet. Blue ink pen, thank you. Yes. I also labeled the arms right and left. Thank you. And I believe on those exhibits, one says front at the bottom and one says back. That's correct. And have you had an opportunity to mark on both of those? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask that those be shown to both court and counsel. All right. We'll have the bailiff assist with that, please. I'll take a quick look at them and then they can be handed to defense counsel.
Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. I don't know if there's any way you can make a record as to what you saw, um, but I think we need to make a record of some sort. And, Your Honor, once I was shown them again, I was intending to make a record. <clears throat> All right, if you okay. want to do that, Ms. Blake. And I guess just starting with the fact that there were no markings on those when the witness received them and no one else was marked on them. Um, and I think if we can put that into the record, I don't believe anyone has marked on it but the witness. With regard to 179A, that diagram is labeled front at the bottom. You have indicated several markings. Uh, could you indicate what those markings represent? Sure. Each of those marks, and they are certainly not to scale, nor am I an artist, but they are representations of bruises uh, that were present on her arms and chest. And by one hand is a letter R, and one hand is the letter, letter L. Did you add those? I did. And those represent? Just right and left, just to clarify, especially with the back. And to be clear, you did not write the front. That was already written on there when handed to you, correct? Correct. And then with regard to the 179B, it's labeled back at the bottom. You did not write the word back. Is that correct? I did not. And there are, and on the last one, I guess I should indicate a total of six blue dots on the one labeled front. Does that comport with how many you added? I believe so, yes. And on the one labeled back, the 179B, there are four markings. And what would those markings represent? Uh, those are also bruises uh, of the same sort. Um, and again, not to scale, uh, they are of varying sizes, but roughly in the same uh, size range as what those pictures depict. And these are bruises that you observed during the autopsy of Tammy Daybell? Yes. And Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of States Exhibit 179A and 179B. Any objection? Based on the testimony, I have no objection. Okay. And the court would consider those as demonstrative exhibits? Yes, and I would ask to be able to publish them. You can publish them, and they are admitted. And this is the first exhibit. It's labeled front at the bottom. Can you, and you've already talked about these marks indicating bruises. They're not to scale. Can you put into the record where on the body you had observed these bruises? Sure. Uh, those injuries on the right arm are on the upper right arm over the lateral biceps area. Um, the one on the right forearm is at the edge, the outside edge, with the uh, palm forward, which is what is typically described as normal anatomic position. So this, this diagram is such that the person is standing with their palms forward. Um, and that mark on the right forearm is towards the uh, outside with the hands uh, positioned that way um, forward. The mark on the chest is on the upper portion of the chest above the breast uh, on the chest. And then the uh, one on the left arm is over the left biceps. And this is State's Exhibit 179B. It's labeled back at the bottom. And you've already talked about those marks a little bit, but can you indicate into the record and for the jury where exactly you found the those bruises? Sure. Again, this is a picture of the back of the body. So uh, the, the two on the upper arm, those two bruises are located over the triceps area on the back of the upper arm. And then the... Uh, the two on the forearm, again, this is uh, in anatomic position with the palms forward. So these are on the back of the back of the forearm with them positioned that way. 
And did you discover any bruising on the lower extremities? Did not. When you conduct the examination, do you document any external injuries as you go? Yes. Were photos, in fact, taken of these bruises that you observed? They were. And, Your Honor, I have what's been marked States Exhibit 178A through 178B. I believe counsel has a copy and the court has a courtesy copy. I'm not sure if we have an official copy for the, in the record yet. I've got uh, the court's courtesy copies. And counsel, on a couple of these, as we previously discussed, I think they ought to be shown uh, privately to the jurors, as we've done previously with other graphic photos. So do you want to organize those in such a way that we have a group that are not shown that way so we don't have to go back and forth? Is that possible? So we've got A and C. And... Hey. I think we could make it. I think uh, they just go in order of documenting the bruises, sometimes getting in closer based on the area where the photo was taken. Okay. And I think maybe what I would ask is if the court would allow, because I, um, and I understand these have not been admitted yet either, but for purposes of starting with, if I could have the witness shown the exhibit and then possibly for reference have him be able to look at the exhibits in order, but pull the ones that need to be published separately and publish those after. Very well. That would be great. I don't know if council has an objection to that, but. No objection. Okay. We'll do so it. if I can have the witness shown this copy. If you could look through those photographs. those appear to be an accurate depiction of what you observed during the autopsy? Yes. And, Your Honor, I would move for the admission of States Exhibits 178A through 178B. And that's through, you're just moving to admit A and B? A through B. Sorry, B is in Victor. B, okay. 178A through V, any objection? May I board here in A? You may board here. <coughs> um, Dr. Christensen, these photographs that were taken, uh, they were taken at your uh, request during the autopsy, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And these were taken in uh, Salt Lake City at uh, at your pathology clinic or where where you do your autopsies? Yes, at the office of the medical examiner. <clears throat> and you were present when they were when these were taken? Yes. And are these a complete and a complete copy of all the autopsy photos that were taken? I, I don't believe so, no. There are many more pictures that we took besides these. Okay. Uh, but as far as the ones that are represented here, uh, did you review these 
uh, after the autopsy in relation to when you were writing your report? Yes. In conjunction with that report? <laughs> yes. Okay. And some of these uh, indicate that, well, I'm not going to get into that yet. I have no objection, Your Honor. Very well. Exhibits 178 A through V are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And pursuant to uh, what the courts indicated, if I could have the witness retain a copy um, to, re to reference as we are publishing only some of them is my understanding right now. Okay. I'll have. And I can either give them my copy. They... They have the same exhibit stickers, so whether I retain the copy he was just looking at or this one, I don't know if the court has a preference. All right. The ones that are published should probably be the originals, so um, when they are published, so we'll have the witness have the copy exhibit from your folder. That would be fine. Yes. And, Doctor, as we go through these, some of these are not going to be uh, published at this time, but in order for you to have the reference, because I believe they go in order where some of the injuries were documented. Um, on that first photo, that is not going to be published at this time, 178A. Can you indicate what that depicts? Uh, it's a picture of uh, Ms. Daybell's uh, left upper chest uh, showing the bruise on her, on her chest, left chest. And that next photo, 178B, is that a closer view of that same bruise? Yes, it is. And, Your Honor, I would ask to publish 178B. You can publish that. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Is that uh, the bruise that you were referencing? Um, yes. And then, again, we're not publishing right at this time 178C, but can you indicate what is depicted in that photo? 178C shows uh, Ms. Daybell's uh, right upper arm and the right side of her chest uh, with the uh, bruises on her right biceps. And is 178D a closer view of that? It is. And, Your Honor, just so I don't ask in between each one, the ones that have been approved to be published, can I go ahead and publish those? Yes, you can, Ms. And that's the is that a that's the closer up view of that bruising? Yes, it is. And then if we look at the next photo, one seventy eight E. What are we seeing in this photo? Uh, this shows uh, Ms. Daybell's right forearm, the back of her right forearm, and her the right side of her body, uh, but with the bruises on her right forearm. And in 178F, is that a closer view of the same bruise? It is. Bruises, plural. Oh, bruises. In 178G, can you indicate what we're seeing in this photo? Yes, this is the uh, front side of uh, Ms. Daybell's uh, uh, right forearm with a bruise. And that 178H? Is a close-up of G, close-up of the same injury. And then we are not publishing at this time 178I, but can you indicate what that shows? Uh, 178I shows a, a section of the uh, uh, one of the injuries on the right biceps where we have taken a tissue sample uh, and made an incision into the arm to demonstrate the uh, one that there is hemorrhage in the tissues uh, that the bruise is in fact a bruise um, and shows also uh, the cassette the little uh, plastic device that we place the tissue in to be prepared for uh, microscopic examination and if i publish 178j Is that another view of the incision you were just describing? Um, I believe so, but I can't be certain. Um, it's 
very, very close up, but I can't, I can't tell you for sure if it's the same or not. I think it is, but. Um, if I go to 178K. Yes. 178K is the same, same injury and the same section. And so just to go over that a little bit, you indicate uh, you end up taking a sample of where the bruise is. Yes. And what does that allow you to determine? Um, as I mentioned previously, it allows us to look at that tissue under the microscope to see um, what sort of progression that injury has gone through. Is it, is it just hemorrhage, um, which is what we see generally in the initial stages of any injury, just bleeding into the tissue uh, in a blunt injury? Uh, over time, those soft tissues go through a, a progression where inflammatory cells come in in an attempt to clean up the injury. Um, over time, the nature of those inflammatory cells change. Eventually, you end up with uh, tissue cell types that make scar tissue, and then eventually you just end up with scar. Uh, and all of that takes place in a you know, uh, somewhat protracted way over, over several uh, days to weeks. Um, but looking at that under the microscope at least gives us some indication of where in that process the injury is. And as you were going through this process with the bruising on Ms. Daybell, were you able to make any determination with regard uh, to the age of the bruising? Um, all of it, uh, all of the sections that we look at under the microscope showed only hemorrhage. They were uh, acute injuries. And would you be able to say if they occurred prior to or after her death? Um, most likely prior. Um, certainly you can uh, inflict bruises on an individual who has recently died um, if you you know, strike them, drop them, any number of other things. If, uh, But once circulation stops, you tend to not have a lot of uh, accumulation of hemorrhage within the tissue simply because there's no circulation, no blood pressure. And on this slide in particular, is that the sample that's sitting on the, in the plastic? Yes. And with regard to that, and I'm not sure if there's a laser pointer up yes, there, there, there might is. be. Can you describe where we're seeing the hemorrhage and what it should look like? Sure. So this this piece of tissue here, this is the skin surface um, along the closest to the number here. Um, this is the skin surface. Normally, all of this uh, tissue beneath here is what we call subcutaneous fat. It normally looks like this yellow tissue over here. It's just bright yellow, um, like any kind of fatty tissue, and all of this dark discoloration is hemorrhage within that fatty tissue. And I believe we are not publishing uh, photo 178L right now, but could you describe what, what's in that photo? Um, it is, a, again, a, a picture of uh, an incision into a, an injury on her right biceps, uh, which shows hemorrhage in the underlying soft tissue. And then if we look at photo 178M. This is a photo of a section taken from the right forearm. Um, again, shows the uh, skin surface. Um, oh. Sorry, I was trying to adjust the light a little bit there. That should disappear. Again, the skin surface is along here. This is bright yellow uh, for the most part, except for a little bit of uh, hemorrhage uh, in the soft tissue immediately below the middle of that. And did that, again, were you able to determine the time on that bruising or when you thought it would have occurred in relation to death? Uh, it was, again, acute injury, only hemorrhage, no evidence of any inflammatory response. So uh, occurred around the time of death, you know, maybe shortly after, but certainly, you know, more likely to have occurred prior to death and could have occurred prior to death anywhere up to a few hours. And 178N, is that just another view of the same Yes, it appears to be. And 
we are not publishing 178O right now, but could you describe what is in depicted in 178O? 178O is a uh, photograph of a small scar uh, that was present on the right chest wall. And we are not publishing 178P right now, but can you indicate what is depicted in that photo? Um, 178P depicts uh, incisions into the bruise on the left biceps. And then looking at 178Q, are you able to determine what that is an image of? Uh, Q is a closer up image of O. It's that same small scar on the chest wall. And that scarring uh, was older, an older injury? Yes, it was completely healed. Do you simply document uh, other external uh, yes. injuries that you notice, including older scarring? Yes, we do. And then looking at 178R, are you able to determine what that is an image of? Uh, this is a closer up image of 178P, the injury on the left biceps. And again, was a sample taken from there? Yes, it was. And that was done for the same reason uh, with regard to determining the bruise? Yes, it determines, one, that it is a bruise, and two, it uh, gives us some broad range in which it was uh, inflicted or uh, received. And we are not admitting 178S right now, but can you indicate what's depicted in that image? Uh, S depicts the uh, same injury on the left biceps with the tissue sample removed and placed in a cassette. And 178T? Uh, the same thing, just closer up. And this one has the tissue sample by it? Yes. And again, if you could indicate when we're looking at that uh, in the sample, where's the hemorrhage or the bruising? So again, this is the skin surface. Um, this is two sections through that area, um, skin surface on this piece, skin surface on this piece. Uh, this yellow is normal subcutaneous fat, and these darker areas are evidence of uh, injury or hemorrhage. And with regard to 178U? Uh, this represents a uh, close-up uh, view of the bruise on the left chest. And 178V. Uh, 178V again shows the, the uh, same area uh, with the sample removed and placed in the cassette. And so again, is that darker area where you were looking at? Yes, this is the skin surface on the right. Um, of that image, all of this dark is hemorrhage within the tissue. And on the prior exhibits where you had indicated the blue marks, these are the images of those bruisings, the bruises from Ms. Daybell's body? Yes, they are. And then images documenting the subsequent samples taken? Yes. When you looked at Tammy's body, did you notice any signs of lividity? Um, yes. And could you explain a little bit about what lividity is? Sure. Uh, lividity is a normal postmortem change in the body where uh, after death, after circulation ceases, uh, the blood uh, in the body starts to settle uh, within, uh, you know, rather than being moved around by blood pressure, um, it starts to settle in by gravity into whatever the lowest portion of the body is. Um, and that, you know, takes, uh, we don't generally don't see it immediately upon death, but it will start uh, within, you know, 30, 60, 90 minutes afterwards, and it's quite variable uh, when that will start, but it, it will start sometime in a short period after death. Um, and, and then, Eventually, over time, it becomes what we call fixed, uh, meaning it doesn't move. Uh, it's a, if, if someone, for example, uh, were to pass away and lay on the floor on their back for a couple of hours, 
um, and then were to be rolled over to their front. The lividity where that blood had started to pool on their backside would then start to redistribute to their front side because that's now the part that's down. Over time, that changes to the point where, you know, if someone were to lay on the ground for 12 hours, say, instead of two hours, if you were to roll them to their front, you don't really get any substantial redistribution of that blood back to the front because it's become what we call fixed at that point. Um, and so the longer that a person lays in one position um, can help you. But it's a, it's a dynamic process in the sense that um, it goes from, you know, when you first see it, very first see it, if you were to have the ability to watch a person after they die, when you first notice lividity, if you were to move them at that point, it would probably go away entirely. Um, whereas after you know the more number of hours they stay in that same position, it will uh, redistribute, as we call it, move to a different position if the body is moved uh, to a lesser and lesser extent to the point where at some point it will no longer move at all. I'm not sure what I said. It'll no longer be movable. It will be fixed. Mm -hmm. And where did you find lividity on Tammy's body? Um, on the back of her body. Um, there's evidence that uh, she had uh, fixed lividity on her back with blanching. So typically if somebody laying on a flat surface, uh, the parts that are in contact with the floor, which is generally the middle of the upper back, sometimes the shoulder blades and the buttocks and parts of the back of the legs, because of the pressure of the floor, the, the blood will not settle into those areas, and so they are spared, and the areas all around those areas is where you see the lividity. And that was a sort of the typical pattern that was present in Tammy's case. Just to clarify, does lividity allow you to determine a time of death? No, is the short answer. Um, and can you describe what rigor mortis is? Yes. Um, rigor mortis is a post-mortem stiffening of the body um, where uh, after a person passes away, uh, they will develop, the muscles become increasingly rigid. Um, and uh, initially it... Uh, again, much like lividity, it's a progression. Um, early on, you may see it only in what we call the small muscle groups. You can see it in the face, the jaw, in the hands, um, and then it progressed to where the extremities, the long, uh, the limbs will be very stiff and immovable. Um, and if it, if you, uh, are, if you are able to manipulate that person, Early in the postmortem period, you can still break it, is what we call that. It, you can move the body such that the rigor mortis, uh, you know, you're able to overcome the stiffness of the rigor mortis. Um, but after a period of time, that becomes increasingly difficult. Um, and the rigor becomes fully developed, generally speaking, somewhere around 12 hours after death. But that also is a very variable uh, process. And then it will stay, the body will stay stiff once that stiffness develops until the body begins to decompose which is also variable depending on the environment in which they're found. Can you determine a time of death off rigor mortis? Not specifically. I mean, there are certainly, if you have, uh, I mean, those are two of the things that we look at to try and estimate a time of death, or what we call the post-mortem interval. If someone is found dead, how long have they been dead? We can look at lividity. We can look at uh, rigor mortis. We can look at the body temperature if it's taken. There are other things that we can look at that can help us you know, try and narrow that window. But the longer the person has been dead, uh, the wider the estimates would be based on any of those changes. And those changes are just not very specific. And in this case, had you learned what time Tammy's death was reported? Um, I believe it was just before 6 in the morning on the day of her death. And had you learned or heard what the description was with regard to the condition of Tammy? She was described uh, in the reports that we had as being stiff and cold, I believe. And based on the description, would that indicate to you that rigor mortis had set in? Yes. I'm going to object to... Um, Hearsay, he's not going to be able to answer this without relying on somebody else's report or something to that effect. I'll sustain that objection. And, Your Honor, I would argue that it goes for why he does what he does next in his investigation. He's testified that he conducts an investigation as a medical examiner. I'll still sustain the objection at this point based on it uh, coming through a hearsay source. Thank you.
And Your Honor, um, actually, I'll just ask another question. You were not present on the day of Tammy's death, correct? I was not. And you did not get the benefit of reviewing her body? I did not see her body uh, prior to her exhumation. So as a medical examiner, do you rely on external information provided? Yes. It's a normal part of our business. And does that external information allow you to form an ex uh, play into your ability to form an expert opinion regarding a time of um, or at least a reference to when a person may have died? It does. And in this case, did you, in fact, gain external information? Yes. And did you do that as part of a review of a medical history in your investigation? Yes. Did it relate to your diagnosis and estimate or any estimate you could give as to time of death? Yes. And based on what was reported to you, do you, when would you estimate a time of death if you can? Um. So I guess I'll, I'll phrase this in a couple of ways. Um, the presence of rigor mortis, again, as I said, it will generally uh, begin relatively quickly after death, you know, within an hour or two, um, and uh, becomes more and more pronounced for several hours, um, and then will persist until decomposition ensues. Uh, so a you know finding a body that's described as stiff uh, is consistent with the person having been dead for at least an hour or two, but could be much longer. So if Tammy was reported as cold and stiff at 6 a.m., you would estimate her to have been dead for a couple hours at that point, at least? In that ballpark, yes. You wouldn't estimate her death to have been closer in time, such as 5.30, 5.40 a.m.? No. And just circling back... Um, with regard to those bruises, did they play into your ultimate determination regarding a cause of death? Uh, yes. In, in the sense that they are, uh, you know, consistent with her being restrained. And again, you did look at other potential causes of death that would result in a negative autopsy. Yes. And you did not find those to be likely in the case of Tamara Daybell. That's correct. And again, what was the manner and cause of death that you determined in this matter? We determined the cause of death to be asphyxia and the manner of death to be homicide. If I can have just a moment, Your Honor. Yeah, ma'am. Your Honor, I don't believe I have any additional questions. Um, with regard to the exhibits that weren't published, I think we could handle it a couple ways. One would be to simply have the jury be able to review that packet. Um, I believe the witness has already testified or indicated what those uh, photos show. All right. It may be more efficient, actually. So you'd be handing the packet around individually to the jurors? Yes, if we were able to do that, um, I think we can set the monitors up. We prepared to do that pretty quickly to just publish those so that uh, the public doesn't view them. And I think we can get that done probably more quickly. Okay. We prepared for that this time, so. We'll also have to move some of the cameras as well, Judge. I don't know. You, you can see the cameras probably. I can't. Okay. I think they've... All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk.
Yeah, why don't you put a test one on there and we'll make sure it's all working right and then you can publish the remainder. All right. I presume the jurors are able to see that on their monitor. Okay. I'm going to publish to the jury states exhibit 178A. And I had previously asked you to describe what was in 178A, but can you explain to the jurors what they are seeing there? Yes, this is uh, Tammy's left chest uh, and shoulder and upper arm that depicts the bruising on the upper uh, left chest. And for the benefit of the jurors, I just republished 178B. Is that a closer image of that same bruise? It is. And with regard to 178C, I'll publish that for the jurors. I don't know if it matters, but it's upside down on my screen. It does matter. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking at it blind on what you're all seeing. So can you describe what we're seeing here? Yes, this is the bruising on her uh, right biceps area. And for the benefit of the jurors, I'm going to republish 178D. And is that a closer up image of the same bruising? Yes, it is. One seventy eight I. Okay, yeah, this is a section uh, uh, shows her right upper arm and uh, chest wall uh, with the uh, section removed from her right biceps with the injury in that area. And we did see some additional images of closer up photos of this, correct? Yes, we did. One seventy eight L. Again, this is uh, right biceps and uh, right uh, chest wall with an area of injury uh, with a section taken through it to demonstrate the hemorrhage in the tissue. One seventy eight O. This is the scar on her uh, right chest wall. Does not show up very well in the projected image that I'm looking at. Uh, but is it just above the white ruler? Um, I can tell where it is because I can see it in this picture, but I would not be able to tell where it is on in there. that picture. <laughs> So the jurors would maybe be able to see it better on the actual photo. Yes. I mean, it looks like a scar in the actual photo. And with that scar, that was not indicative of any recent injury? No. 178P. Uh, this depicts her uh, left upper arm. Yeah, thank you. A left upper arm and uh, left chest and body wall uh, with uh, incision made into the bruise on her left biceps. One seventy eight S. This is the same injury on her left biceps with the sections removed and placed in the cassette. And your honor, I believe that was um, 
the whole of the photos that had not been full, former, formerly published. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, does that conclude your direct? That does conclude my direct. Okay, we can get things reconfigured then um, after. So we'll be up to cross-examination. However, given the time of day, I'll suggest we do break for the day. And Mr. Thomas, will you be conducting that, cross? That's what I would ask, Judge, if we could just break for the day. Very I know nice. they want to hear my cross, but not five minutes worth. Okay. We will conclude for the day then. Um,